Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a great honor for me to be a chairperson for the seminar session, especially this session. Uh, first, uh, and on behalf of all organizer staff, I would like to extend a welcome to all of you. Uh, we have light up a uh, fruitful, we have light up for you to be fruitful and engaging as you can see in the in the program set schedule. And now please allow me to introduce you the first presenter for today. Uh, Assistant Professor Ranakda De Shatilo. Uh, she is going to talk in the topic of investigations of effect of physiological and hemodynamic change observed in patients with diabetic nephropathy on glomerular fluid and macromolecular filtration through a mathematics simulation implying hinder transport really. Please welcome our uh, assistant professor, Dr. Pranatta. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to be here to be presenting our research funded by the Asahi Glass Foundation. The title of today's talk is Investigation of Effects of Physiological and Hemodynamic Changes Observed in Patients with Diabetic Nephropathy on Glomerular Fluid and Macromolecular Filtration through a mathematical simulation employing hinder transport theory. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Panada Deshadilo, the lead investigator of the project as well as today's presenter. We will start with one vital organ, kidneys. Kidneys are extremely hardworking organs. It, each day it filters about 200 liters of blood in order to keep our blood composition constant within our circulation. The first step of that process happens right here in the glomeruli. Inside the glomerular capillaries are the blood plasma. Excess fluid and metabolic waste are filtered through the multi-layer capillary wall into the bone mass space containing primary urine right here. The, uh, the gomerula capillary wall structure is quite interesting and I would like to take a minute to talk about that. Innermost layer is the endothelial cell layer that are finasteride, which means they are full of holes. And these holes are not empty, it's filled with JGs or glycose aminoglycans. The second layer is the gomerula basement membrane, and that's a hydrogel, 90% water and 10% fibers. And of course, the outermost layer is the epithelial cell layer with the food processes being connected by planar arrangement of fibers known as the slip diaphragm. It is known that the abnormalities of this structure actually um, are actually associated with renal disease and that become the incentive of our project. We have two objectives. First, we would like to construct a mathematical model to explore how each layer contributes to glomerular selectivity. And the second objective has to do with one renal disease, diabetic nephropathy, one of the major cause for end-stage kidney failure. In order to construct a mathematical model, first we need to simplify um, a very complicated structure of the glomerular filtration surface into simple geometry. So the glomerular capillaries are viewed as a network of parallel cylinder. And its um, wall is multi-layer, as you can see right here. The first layer are finestra, filled with um, fibers the same size as that of GAGs. The second layer are fibrous medium, resembling GBM in a sense that 5% of its fibers um, volume fraction is that of type 4, um, the, the fiber the same size as type 4 collagen. And another 5% is contributed by fibers the same size as DAG. Finally, the slit diaphragm are viewed as a row of parallel cylinder with non uniform spacing. Um, these non uniform spacing between fibers follow the log normal distribution with the mean and standard deviation obtained from helium ion microscopy. 
This wall, even though it is multi-layer, allow a leakage of fluid, with JV being the local transcapillary velocity that is dependent on the hydraulic pressure difference, delta P, and the osmotic pressure difference, delta pi. KFS right here is the hydraulic permeability of the filtration surface, or the average fluid velocity per unit pressure difference. Its inverse can be thought of as um, the hydraulic pressure, um, sorry, the hydraulic resistance of the filtration surface, and it is simply the addition of the hydraulic resistance of each of the layers adding together. So the first thing we need to calculate is the plasma flow rate, but designated here as Q. Q decline as a function of X, with X being the distance from the upstream end or the afferent end of the capillary. And Q decline as a function of X because there is a leakage of fluid through the wall. The larger JV is, the faster Q decline as a function of X. JV, of course, it is, it is dependent on delta P and delta pi, with delta P and delta pi being the hydraulic and the osmotic pressure difference. Delta pi, in turn, is dependent on the plasma protein concentration inside the lumen, designated here as C protein. So we need to calculate that and read it under assumption that um, the flux of the plasma protein inside the lumen is mainly the convective flux, and it is conserved throughout the capillary length. And then we were able to obtain differential equation for opening the protein plasma, um, the plasma protein concentration. But um, that's not enough as it is dependent on JV, and JV is dependent on delta P and delta pi. Delta pi has C protein contained in it, but delta P itself is an independent unknown. So we need another differential equation for that. Um, and that is simply, um, the, the, the equation that we simply use is that the decline of the pressure inside the cylinder, um, inside the capillary is that of a cell flow contained in a cylindrical tool. What we have to do is we have to guess the value of uh, delta P at the afferent end of the capillary. Keep on guessing until we were able to get JV that is um, yield, that, that yield the correct value of the Gomura filtration rate reported from experiment. After that's done, we know C protein and we know JV for all value of X. The next step, of course, is to deal with the test solute concentration inside and outside the capillary lumen. Inside the capillary lumen, um, we assume that this test solute, as we are focusing on size selectivity, the test solutes are not charged, rigid, and spherical. And eventually, we'll be comparing to um, the filtration of five calls, which are highly cross-linked polysaccharide that are rigid, spherical, and not absorbed in the tubule. The calculation is done pretty much in the same fashion as described in the last slide. The way to relate um, the concentration of the test solute inside and outside the capillary lumen is through a, param um, a parameter we would call local solute sieving coefficient. It's simply the ratio of the tracer in the urine and that in the blood plasma in the capillary lumen. The sieving coefficient of the whole structure is the product of the sieving, uh, the sieving coefficient of each cellular layer. After that's done, we will be able to um, obtain the profile of the plasma protein concentration and the test solute concentration inside uh, the capillary lumen. As you can see, an increase as a function of X. And in the end, what we can actually compare to experimental data is the sieving coefficient, but it has to be averaged over the length of the capillary, and it is done right. After that's done, we compare that to the experimental data um, obtained from Y-star rats by Ray PAO back in 2007, displayed here as the spherical black dots. There are two factors um, associated with diabetic nephropathy that we would like to explore. First, we would like to explore the effects of degradation of GAG in the endothelial finish tract caused by um, hyperglycemia. Free GAG um, in parenthesis EN. 
is um, the bloom fraction of GAG in the endothelial finish strand. You can see that as it declines, the value of the average saving coefficient actually increased significantly. Whereas if we take a look at the effect of the hemodynamic change associated with the diabetic nephropathy, which is the increase of the net gomula pressure difference caused by the combination of gomula hypertension and reduced osmotic pressure due to proteinuria, we found that the effect itself is very small. It only slightly reduced the sieving coefficient. Therefore, the effect of the degradation of GAG in the endothelial finistra is actually larger. One problem that is our results agree well with the experimental data up until um, the solute radius, A being the solute radius, about 5.5 nanometer. For larger solute radius, our calculation underestimate the sieving coefficient actually quite a lot. There must be another pathway for large macromolecules, and we have to come back to that. At first, we have a question. And this question might lead to a simplification of our calculation significantly. Uh, instead of having to average everything over the length of the capillaries, we're wondering like, if we can use what we would call a one unit approximation, meaning that we view the gomula filtration surface as being repetition of one subunit consisting of three layers that we have talked about. And you would just use the average JV in the calculation, and we found that one unit approximation underestimates the sieving coefficient, but the underestimation is quite small. Therefore, it is employed in our subsequent calculation. And the next factor associated with diabetic nephropathy that we um, take a look is the thickening of GBM. And, um, but we found that even though we increase LGBM, the thickness of GBM twofold, it almost did not change the saving coefficient of the test solute. And of course, there is still a problem of the possible pathway for the large macromolecule. So to um, explore the possibility of that, I mean, I mean of the pathways, um, we take a more careful look at the structure of the capillary wall. It consists, of course, um, two thirds of that is covered by the um, gomula filtration surface, the three layer gomula filtration surface, as we have talked about, the endothelial cell layer, the GBM, and the epithelial cell layer. But one third of that, approximately, is covered by a different geometry. Um, there are still the endothelial cell layer right here, the GBM and the epithelial cell layer, but between GBM and the endothelial cell layer, there is another layer called mesentium. So we decided to actually explore that as a possible, is it gonna be a possible, possible pathway for large macromolecules? So we decided to construct um, a model um, by solving steady state the convection diffusion equation using a um, finite element scheme and eventually found the average sieving coefficient. We designated that as theta total right here. It's simply the average of the sieving coefficient across the three layer filtration surface and um, the sieving coefficient across the four layer barrier that include mesentium. Using the fraction of the so it volume passing through these barriers as the weighting factor. But what we found, however, is that including the four layer barrier does not change the result very much. Including only filtration surface or including both filtration surface and the four layer barrier that has mesentium inserted between endothelial cell layer and GBM almost graphically yield the saving coefficient that is almost graphically that are almost graphically indistinguishable and of course. So therefore um, the four layer barrier is probably not the possible pathway it does not explain the leakage of large macromolecule right here. And the possible pathway for large macromolecule remains very much to be elucidated.
So this will be our conclusion that among all physiological and hemodynamic changes associated with diabetic nephropathy, JAG damage due to hyperglycemia likely to significantly increase glomerular solute filtration, even without considering charge effect. By size effects alone, it increased solute sieving coefficient significantly. It is worth noting also that our complete results agree with five core sieving coefficients from an in vivo studies for solute radii up until 5.5 nanometer. For larger solute, another possible pathway might exist and it is the direction of our future work. Before ending this talk, I would like to thank all the funding sources for allowing this work to be possible. And we are deeply grateful for the support from the Asahi Glass Foundation. And these are the references employed in our work in this presentation and in our report. Reference number 17 and 18 are the manuscript produced from this research project. And we are very grateful for that. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much for the very interesting talk. Uh, now it's time I will open the floor for the question. Are there any questions from the floor? Uh, if there's no questions, uh, I have one question for your your last uh, investigation. Uh, you say that the macromolecule is is not the possible mechanism for the macromolecule is not missing gem and also the endothelial and glomerular thickness. So is that a possible that a uh, macromolecule would leakage from the the destru destruction of the podocyte. From our calculation, the effect of the podocyte itself is found to be quite small. That um with the the, the latest um microscopic image of the podocyte itself, um the size between um the the fibers arrangement, the interfiber spacing has the mean um, that is much larger than the, the um, five core radii that we use. Therefore, it's um, not the barrier. I mean, taking, uh, taking that out from the calculation does not change the saving coefficient very much. But we propose, can I share screen by the way? Is it possible? Yes. Can I have? Yes, um, oh, thanks a lot. Hey. But we have one um, assumption that we were very, very excited about. Yeah. Okay, um, it would be this, I'm sorry. Yes, we found this paper and we were very, very excited about that between the, the uh, filtration surface the consisting of the uh, endothelial cell layer, the DPM and the podocyte, and these are the mesenchyme. Um, between them, we found that the, this is uh, the red blood cell. It can escape through that, which mm -hmm. that, um, and sometimes it's um, sometimes that's open, and sometimes it's closed, cutting the red blood cell in half. And the red blood cell are found even in healthy humans, um, and they are deformed. I mean, those that escape into the urine are deformed. So um, our guess is that this is the maximum uh, the the location, the junction between the the filtration surface, the three layer filtration surface, and the four layer that include the mesenchyme are the location with the highest shear stress. And we speculate that it might do things to the collagen orientation. It might change the collagen orientation and change the integrity of the barrier right there. It's possible to have like an opening right there. And this opening um, that periodically open and close might be the reason why, um, might be the possible pathway for very, very large macromolecule. And we did one, um, preliminary results that looks quite good, but we still have to check. This is like really, really early result. It looks like that. That if you include only just one, one holes per glomeruli, it explains the result. That that um, at least in that sense, if you include the um, a hole between junction and open and close as a function of time, you can explain 
that it can be a possible pathway for, for the large macromolecule. But we so they will have to check a lot of things and we have to check against another, um, other experiments. It's still a long way to go, but we are very, very excited about that. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very happy to answer them because we are very I, I hope you to success with this project. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm so, so happy. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very okay. much for your uh, nice presentations. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay, uh, so I'll start sharing the screen. Thanks so much. Uh, now let's move to the next topic. This is the this is the talk from Professor Dr. Thanapat Palaka from the Department of Microbiology. Uh, Professor Thanapat Palaka is a, a expert in the macrophages as I know because he is my one of my uh, mentor. Uh, please welcome. Uh, today, uh, doc, Professor Dr. Thanapat will uh, talk in the topic of crosstalk between liver cancer cells and tumor associated macroph macrophages in three dimensional spheroid culture. Good afternoon. My name is Thanapat Palaka from the Department of Microbiology, Faculty of Science, Jhelum Kong University. Today, I will share with you the result of the Asahi Glass Foundation funded research project titled Crosstalk Between Liver Cancer Cells and Tumor Associated Macrophages in a Three Dimensional Spheroid Culture. Liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma is the, the leading cause of cancer related death in Thailand. Various factors are known to cause liver cancer, including infection by hepatitis B and C virus. The detailed mechanism of liver cancer is still not well understood. In recent years, increased incidence of non-viral mediated liver cancer are also increasing. The five-year cancer survival rates in the US and around the world have increased dramatically in recent years. Unfortunately, liver cancer is one of the less survival cancers among pancreatic, lung, and esophagus cancer. Therefore, the need to understand the molecular mechanism will allow us to better treat patients for this deadly cancer. The tumor mass constitute a very complicated tumor microenvironment, or TME. It is a complex network of heterogeneous population of cancer cells, variety of resident and infiltrating immune cells, secreted factors, and extracellular matrix proteins. This TME influences tumor progression and metastasis. In addition, it also influences the therapeutic response and resistance. Therefore, understanding the tumor microenvironment will allow one to better design a therapeutic approach for cancers. Within the tumor mass, there are many types of infiltrating immune cells, such as T cells, B cells, and macrophages. Macrophages are the innate immune cells that play a very important role in defense against infection. But in cancer, macrophage density is shown in various types of cancer to be a predictor of poor survival, meaning that the more macrophage density, the less survival of the cancer patient. Macrophage phenotype can be divided roughly into two phenotypes. The M1 phenotype express very sign signature M1 markers such as inflammatory cytokines, reactive oxygen species, and chemokines. This type of macrophages are known to have anti-tumoral activity. In contrast, the M2 phenotype express various chemokines and 
uh, tissue repair molecules. These macrophages have shown to be a pro-tumoral activity. Tumor-associated macrophages are a major component of monocyte infiltrating the tumors. This slide shows the tumor-associated macrophages together the, with the pancreatic cancers. The cells that are stained in dark brown are CD68 positive macrophages that are found inside the tumor mass. Cytokines and growth factors produced by tumor cells play a role in regulating tumor associated mac macrophages functions. Understanding the crosstalk between cancer cells and TAMs will be useful for the discovery of novel therapeutic targets. To study the interaction between tumor cells and macrophages, the use of three-dimension cancer spheroid culture is useful. Cells are interact in a 3D system together with um, extracellular matrix. This three-dimension 3D culture system change will lead to change in intracellular signal transduction that impacts cell behavior, such as migration, differentiation, cellular morphology, and proliferation. This interaction also leads to cellular responses similar to those observed in vivo. Therefore, the study that I will present today have three objectives. First is to establish the three-dimensional spheroid culture of liver cancer cells. Second is to study the phenotypes of macrophages in this 3D macrophage tumor co-culture system. And third is to study the impact of manipulating not signaling in tumor associated macrophages, which has been shown by our group to be an M1 bias signaling on tumor growth and phenotypes in 3D co-culture. First, to establish a 3D liver cancer spheroids, we use two liver cancer cell lines, HEPG2 and PLCPI5. HEPG2 are HBS antigen negative, and PLCPI5 are HBS antigen positive, suggesting that these cell lines are probably derived from hepatitis B viral infected individuals. When cells are grown in 2D culture, they look like um, this, but when they are allowed to grow into a 3D liver cancer spheroid, they become a uh, solid uh, spheroid as shown in this slide. After uh, culture cells in this uh, spheroid uh, system for seven and 14 days, we um, analyze the gene expression that are representative of cancer stemness liver cancer function, liver function, and liver cancer cells, and in addition. I, I think there's a uh, missing part of the results. Um, what should I do? <laughs> <laughs> Is, uh, would, would you like some help? Um, I'm not sure uh, what, what's going on. Um, so did um, the file that I sent uh, complete on your and um, if not, then I, I need to present then live because it's it's the it's the end that is important. So I think um, before uh, the 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 cut from those um, the clip, so we perform the uh, RT qPCR to uh, look at the expression of some of the key markers for cancer stemness liver function, liver cancer, and uh, EMT marker. 
And as you can see in both cell lines, the 3D culture uh, in uh, open and gray bar um, shows significantly higher expression of uh, cancer stemness markers, liver functions, uh, and also the EMT, suggesting that 3D culture is much more um, resemble what happening in vivo. So next, we um, use this uh, cancer spheroid that we uh, um, uh, you, uh, we make and co-culture with the uh, with the primary human monocytes that are isolated using CD14 as a marker. Uh, so the way we did it is we. Um, use the 3D culture spheroid um, for seven days with our monocytes. And then we dissociate the, the spheroid using trypsin. Then we put in the primary human monocytes and culture for five days and seven days. And then we use cytometer and QRT-PCR to analyze the phenotype. Uh, first, what we analyze is the um, marker for M1 and M2. The M1 markers are CD80 and CD86. The M2 markers are CD206 and CD163. As you can see in both cell line, PRC, PRF5, and HEP G2 on your uh, right hand side, the co culture with the um, cancer spheroid significantly increased the marker of M2, which, is, which are CD206 and CD163 in both cell line at day five and day seven. On the other hand, the markers for M1, CD80, and CD86, even though uh, increased slightly, but not as high as the M M2 markers. So this result indicating that when uh, monocytes are incubated with 3D cancer spheroid, they induce macrophages to become an M2 pro-tumoral type. Whether this affect the growth of the tumor. So we measure the tumor spheroid sites. And as you can see here in both cell line, the PRCPR5 and HEP G2, the, co the um, cancer spheroid alone with our monocyte um, have this uh, low area of spheroid. But when we add the monocyte into the culture, we, sh we found that the size of the uh, tumor spheroid increased significantly, at least twice as much as the control. So um, the last part of the talk will focus on manipulating the signaling in monocytes. So we, our previous re, uh, results suggesting that if we increase the signaling of notch or, or NICD1 in macrophages, it can drive the M1 uh, type of macrophages differentiation. So we um, prepared the NICD1 overexpressing monocytes, which will uh, drive them to become more M1. And then we do the co-culture using the spheroid culture as described previously. So as you can see here, um, when we uh, use the control uh, cells, um, the M2 markers increase uh, significantly. Uh, as used uh, as shown by the primary monocytes. But when we uh, increase the expression of NICD1, the upregulation of M1 marker are more prominent, suggesting that if we can manipulate the signaling in monocytes to bias toward the M1 markers, it might be able to drive the anti-tumoral macrophages in the co-culture system. So in summary, a 3D cancer spheroid represents a better cellular interaction than a 3D culture system. The 3D liver cancer spheroid conditions monocytes to become M2-like uh, tumor-associated mar markers, uh, monocyte macrophages. And uh, utilizing a pro-M1 polarizing signaling may increase anti-tumor immunity in TAMS. So in the future, we are uh, plan to, we are planning to perform a transcriptomic analysis of the tumor associated macrophages isolated from this cancer spheroid co culture system. So uh, uh, I would like to thank the Asahi Glass Foundation and Jalongan University Rachada Pisek Somphot Endowment Fund. Uh, Students who did this work are Paula Patka Vilai, who received the SAST scholarship.
Thank you, and I would like to take any question. Thank you so much uh, for your presentations and very nice result. Uh, now it's time to <coughs> the question from the floor. Are there any questions? <coughs> Uh, as our program, as our schedule program is very tight, as we are a little late now, if there is, is no question from the floor, I will quickly move on to the next topic. Thank you so much, Ajahn Thanapathalaka. Thank you, uh, So now let's move to the next topic which is the cold plasma therapy attenuate multi-drug resistant bacteria into induced infected wound mouse model through the neutralization of bacteria and bacteria biofilm with inducing anti-inflammatory immune cells, especially neutrophil. Presented by uh, Associate Professor Dr. Asadali Rahawanishkun. So this is a conclusion of SRE funding on the, on the topic of the cold plasma therapy at the edge, infected burn wound and new treatment strategy. So what is, what is plasma? Plasma is a fourth state of matters. Uh, there, there are solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Plasma is a, a charge of uh, gas, negative or positive. Uh, there are two classification of plasma. It is a thermal and non-thermal plasma. The non-thermal plasma didn't cause heat burn. So the non-thermal plasma is regularly used in the study of the living cell. Thermal plasma induces free radical scavenge, uh, free radical species. Uh, it is an, an inducer of the free radical, so it removes cells that have an uh, injury. It activates living cells, it kills organisms because free radical induces lipid oxidation, biofilm rupture, DNA damage, and protein dysfunctions. In the living cells, there are several processes of anti the active oxygen species, then the living cell did not, did not die after applied plasma flux. The potential use of the non-thermal plasma are disinfection, proliferation, angiogenesis, cell migration, and re-epithelialization. Re However, the data on plasma flux in immune cells are limited. The immune cell is very important for wound healing process. Immune cell induce the inflammation. The inflammation is very important for the wound healing. Microphage is one of an import, one of the important immune cells. There are two classification of microphage: M1 for inflammation, for inflammation and M2 anti-inflammation. The profile, the the, the exaggerated induction of the M1 induces the inflammation. The exaggerated inflammation causes the delay wound healing process and end to enhance wound healing. In the, in the burn wound, we have necrotic cell. We have the host immune cell. We have the the organism on the on the wound. We would like to re reduce necrotic debris, necrotic tissue. We would like to kill the organism, and we want to activate immune cells. So all of these objectives can be fulfilled by plasma fat. So we can build an in-house non-thermal plasma machine. Uh, so this is built by the fourth year medical student 
สีละพงแววสีทอง so so this is a picture of the non thermal plasma on our tips of finger the research question is can thermal non thermal plasma inhibit inflammation and can non thermal plasma attenuate wound healing process in infected bird wound the hypothesis is the non thermal plasma can inhibit inflammation and it can induce wound healing there are two part of the except uh, of the of the in vitro and in vivo the in vitro we use macrophage cell line to test the the viability of the cell to test the inflammation for the in vivo we use the burn wound mouse model to to see the wound healing process and see the local inflammation in the skin of the mouse in the in vitro we use the macrophage and we induce uh, we apply non thermal plasma we wait around 30 minutes and simulate with lps like polypropylene uh, which are the bacterial toxin and wait around 2 hour and collect the cell so in the cell we detect nf kappa b which which is a transcriptional factor for induced inflammation we found that the plasma activation for 30 second can reduce the inflammation reduce the nf kappa b and the argon gas alone without without the electricity it did, did not have the the attenuation effect however ampk which are the which is the cell marker of a marker of the cell energy status did not change by the plasma so the plasma did not change cell energy to test if the plasma fact in the information inflammatory information or anti-intervention microfish we use the we use lps to simulate m1 simulate uh, m1 the microfish so we see that we see that the, the plasma can reduce the m1 marker in this slide is il1 beta expression at six hour of the simulation and they can reduce plasma can reduce il6 at the 24 hour of the lps simulation for the m2 marker the plasma fact increased il10 expression at three hour and six hour after lps simulation and in the neutral cell neutral cell we use a phosphate buffer solution uh, to 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 incubate with the cell uh, we found that the plasma did not alone plasma alone did not in, induce inflammation but the plasma induced the anti-inflammatory marker this one is a fist expression so so the plasma flux induce the anti-inflammatory macrophage and protect macrophage after the activation by LPS. Next, we, we use plasma to activate fibroblasts, which are, which, which are the cells that are important for the, the wound healing. So we, we close the plasma uh, no, we close the fibroblast. We use the fibroblast cell line L929. We we create uh, a gap between the group of the cell. And this is a control. This is gas alone. This is a fast plasma flux. After wait for 24 hours, we found that the gap uh, between the group of the cell in the plasma treatment is 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 very less so this means that the plasma the plasma flux can uh, uh, improve the epithelialization of the fibroblast so next we 
treat plasma flux on the the burn wound. For the burn wound, we use the metal rod. Uh, put it in 100 degrees Celsius and put on the skin of the mice. After that, we uh, apply the colony of Staphylococcus aureus on the wound. Then we apply plasma flux one daily for one minute per day for six days, and we certify mice for the for analyze the sample at day seven. We found that the wound score size and the moisture of the skin, the dry skin is good. The moisture is not good. For the untreated, large and moist skin can uh, be are demonstrated. In the plasma treatment, the skin is dry and smaller. And we explore the inflammatory cytokine on the skin tissue. We found that the pro inflammatory cytokine in F alpha and IL6 are decreased by plasma flux treatment, but the anti -inflammatory, inflammatory cytokine is not changed. So, for the conclusion, we successful to produce, uh, to, to, to use in house non thermal plasma machine to reduce the inflammation by the reduction of it in if kappa B on the cofish and enhance wound healing process, reduce local inflammation in the infected burn wound of the mice. The recreation of the cofish response and plasma flux treatment are interesting for the future study. So our work is published in the Apply Science a few months ago. So we, uh, I, I would like to thank all of the students and the collaborator. Uh, we are in the Transitional Research in Information and Immunology Research Unit. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for sharing this with us today. Uh, now it's time for questions from the floor. Uh, this is Tana Pat. Very interesting talk. Um, I have a quick question. Um, did you test whether the plasma has an effect on the bacteria growth? Yes. And yes. Also, have you looked at the effect of plasma on neutrophil? Because wound healing also involves neutrophil. Yes, we did, and we prepared another another manuscript on that. And it it has a direct effect on bacteria. So I think it's very will be very good for for the wound that infect by the anti uh, the the microbial with the antibiotic resistance because we use the physical healing of the bacteria. As for another one, the neutrophil is very interesting one actually. As a he, I, I asked this grant from neutrophil, but but the microbial is, <laughs> is is finished first because it's easier. So, but 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 it's more interesting because the neutrophil have the uh, plasma part have the effect on the on the energy of the neutrophil. We we use it. The, we use the seahorse analysis. For, 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 for that and and that's why we, we prepare another one but we don't have money enough to to pay for the publication fee now <laughs> thank you for a really good a really good question okay uh, I hope a time we'll get the funding <laughs> okay thank you. Uh, now let's move to the next topic which is uh, present by Professor Dr. Ubonrat Siri Trawan. Uh, today, Professor Dr. Ubonrat will talk in the topic of early detections of atronos on mango flute using hyperspectral imaging. Please welcome. Hello, the next research would be about early detection of anthracnose on mango fruit using hyperspectral imaging. Mango is one of the most popular and the most important economic fruit of Thailand. However, mango is susceptible to the anthracnose disease. But during the 
latent or early stage of infection, the mango would show no symptoms, but the appearance of the symptom would occur only when the mango enter the ripening stage. And therefore, early detection of anthracnose infection is challenging. And so the objective of this research is to develop a rapid, simple, and non-destructive method based on hyperspectral imaging coupled with chemometrics and image analysis for early detection of anthracnose infection on mango. Uh, in this research, we propose the use of hyperspectral imaging or HSI because this technique is more powerful than conventional spectroscopy technique. The HSI combines spectroscopy with the computer vision so we can obtain both spectral and spatial information from, from the analysis. For the methodology, the mango used in this research was namdokmai. The mango would be cleaned with 200 ppm sodium hypochlorite and rinsed twice with tap water and dried. After that, each mango would be wounded using a sterile needle and then the mango would be inoculated with the fungal inoculum at the concentration of 10 to the 6 spore forming units per milliliter. And the mango would be stored at 20 degrees Celsius and 90% relative humidity. And um, during the incubation, the mango would be analyzed using SSI for every other day. For the scanning, we use the wavelength range from 400 to 1000 nanometer with five nanometer resolution. So we would obtain the spectral data with 121 wavelength data point. This picture show the result that obtained from the HSI. This is the signal intensity profiles of healthy skin here and uh, infected skin. So uh, the fingerprint look different. This would be useful for the data classification. And as I mentioned before, the HSI technique provide not only spectral data, but also the spatial data. For the spatial data, we select the region of interest with a pixel size of 100 by 50 pixels. And on each pixel, we can obtain the, um, a full spectrum of, uh, on that location. And the spectral data in this case would be uh, 121 uh, wavelength data point. And so we obtain the hypercube data. The hypercube data comprise uh, 100 by 50 pixel by 121 wavelength. And this picture show the reflectance spectra of mango from different incubation time, varied from day zero to uh, day 10. You can see that the fingerprint of uh, the mango from different incubation time look different. And before further analysis, first we need to do the mathematical pretreatment of our reflectance data. The pretreatment was done in order to eliminate the intrinsic noise that caused by the non-uniformity of the light scattering during the scanning. This also was used to reduce the spectral variability due to the morphological effect of the mango fruit. After that, we use principal component analysis for the data exploration and data reduction. And the result from PSA would be um, used for data classification by using the technique called discriminant factor analysis. And after that, we use the data for uh, construction of the symptom distribution map. This is done in order to facilitate the data visualization. The result from PCA here, 
from the PCA, we obtain the loading plot and score plot. The loading plot gives the information of the significant wave length that can be uh, that would be useful for the data classification for the score plot here. This can be obtained by plotting the data on the new coordinate and uh, the score plot can show a trend of sample cluster, but it cannot clearly discriminate the sample into different, different subgroups. In order to classify the, the data, we use the discriminant factor analysis and the result is shown here. The DFA can discriminate sample into different subgroups, into six subgroups, varied from uh, mango with and without infection and mango with uh, different severity of the symptoms. And the DFA can give the high accuracy as high as 95%. And lastly, we construct the uh, symptom distribution map. The color that appear on the map uh, would, uh, can represent the severity of the antagonal symptom. The, the dark blue indicate no infection and the dark red indicate higher severity of infection. And you can see the score of the severity on this uh, score bar on the right, on the right hand side here. And let's take a look at uh, mango on day two. With the human naked eye, we cannot observe any infection of anthracnose on the mango fruit. But with the HSI result, we can see that that's a sign of uh, anthracnose symptom. And the severity of the symptom increase with the incubation time. And therefore, we can conclude that the hyperspectral imaging integrated with chemometrics and image analysis can be used uh, for uh, detect and classify the infection at the early stage before the onset of disease symptoms, as well as the difference in severity of the symptom and pseudocolor image of the uh, symptom distribution map can facilitate visualization and interpretation of different levels of infection. And uh, we hope that the success of this research would prevent anthracnose infected mango from entering the food chain. And lastly, we would like to thank the Asahi Glass Foundation for funding this research. And we also would like to thank the Thailand Ray Science Foundation for the complementary financial support. And um, thank you very much for thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Dr. Ubunrat, for your talk. Now it's time for question. If there is no question from the floor, I will move to the next topic, which is the functional identification of DOF transcription factor, controlling auxin biosynthesis and starch degradation in durian fruit ripening, uh, presented by Associate Professor Dr. Supha Srikan Tarama from Department of Biochemistry, Faculty of Science. So, good afternoon. My research is related to this important fruit to Thailand, durian, the king of fruit. Our group is interested in identifying genes involved in durian fruit ripening and flavors. This research focuses on a transcription factor family called DOF that can control the expression of many genes during ripe and we will see which genes are controlled by them. 
First of all, without funding, this work would not be possible. I'd like to thank the funding from the Asahi Glass Foundation and also a partial support from Jolalongkorn University to our molecular crop uh, research unit. I also like to thank these two um, researchers involved in this study, Dr. Gauram Reza Kaksa, a postdoc, and Ms. Uh, Pinapat Pinson, a PhD student in our group. Probably I do not need much introduction to this fruit. Everybody knows it as the king of fruit, possibly because of its smell. On top of that, it is extremely important fruit to Thailand. We export the fruit to many countries all over the world that brings a lot of income to our country. So understanding mechanism um, during ripening uh, is important to further um, cultural development. In Thailand, we do have more than 200 durian cultivars, but in this research, we focus on these um, two cultivars, Montong and Puomani, which shows the different characteristics. Montong produce my order, while Puomani produce a uh, much, much um, stronger smell. Another important feature is that Montong ripens much slower than Pulmoni, so it is the cultivar's uh, suiting for exportation. So it ripens when it arrives at its destinations, Why Pulmoni um, might ripen during transport, transportation that we do not want it happen. What we try to do is understand uh, ripening mechanisms. So we will be able to develop uh, molecular markers for selecting and accelerating durian breeding for a novel elite cultivar and increasing uh, competitiveness over other countries in our region. In this study, we focus on a transcription factor family called DOF, a DNA binding with one finger, in short, DOF. We found its binding motif in many promoter regions of ripening associated genes, such as in this figure, methionine, uh, gamma lyase, or MGL, which is the main uh, enzyme involved in durian sulfuryl order production. Without this gene, durian will not smell sulfur at all. Previously, we performed genome-wide identification of DOF transcription factor in Montong durian. And in this study, we rediscovered DOF in Montong and another cultivar pulmony, which I already introduced to you, using transcriptome-wide approach. So we perform sequencing uh, of pulp RNA at three different uh, ripening stages, uh, unripe, midripe, unripe uh, stages of both cultivar and map those reads to the reference genome from Durian um, Musang King, uh, which is the famous cultivar from Malaysia. After that, we performed transcriptome Y identification of DOF and expression profiling. Uh, we further selected two DOF candidates for further um, analysis. Before analyzing our RNA-seq data, we validated our, RNA, uh, our data using reverse transcription, quantitative uh, uh, PCR, and the results uh, shown here uh, that the data was fine. According to our RNA-seq data, we identify many ripening associates uh, DOF as shown label with this asterisk, like this one. 
This is a result uh, uh, from Montong. And similar results were obtained for Puomani culture. Of these, cyclic BOF2 show the greatest full change and its expression during um, ripening process. Therefore, it was selected for further analysis. When comparing its expression level between two cultures, Montong in black and Puomani, uh, we found that we found much higher expression level in Puomani cultivar, which is the quick uh, ripening cultivar. So it might be involved with this characteristic. On the other hand, um, DOF 2.1, another ripening associated DOF, shows the highest expression level in both cultivar. Montong and Pumani, this DOF 2.1 was also chosen for further analysis as well. Because of the COVID-19 situation, we couldn't work much on growing plant and do further characterization and also um, laboratory works. We then perform in silico analysis as shown here. We look into gene expression um, correlation to guide the function of our candidate DOF. Genes that are co-expressed uh, usually work together in a particular function. As shown here, we put uh, our cyclic DOF2 with other known um, ripening associated gene and found that cyclic DOF2 positively um, in the, shown in the red color here, co-expressed with Oxin biosynthetic genes uh, such as TAA and yucca, and ethylene biosynthetic genes uh, such as ACS and ACO at uh, much correlation value. Both ethylene and oxin are hormone that are known to regulate fruit ripening. In addition, it also correlates with um, beta. Amylase, which uh, encoding for an enzyme involved in starch degradation to sugar during ripening. So we can taste sweetness when we eat durian. Since cyclic DOF2 is cultivar dependent as shown previously, so it might control quick and slow ripening behavior in these two cultivars. Some of the uh, transcription factor have been uh, reported to control the expression of uh, those genes in other fruits, but not in durian before. Now let's take a look into the highest expressed uh, DOF genes, DOF 2.1. According to our analysis, DOF 2.1 is positively correlated with the genes involved in sulfur order production, MGL. To further confirm if this dove can control the expression of MGL, we perform um, promoter binding assay between DOF 2.1 and the promoter of durian MGL using dual luciferase reporter assay in uh, Arabidopsis, another plant, uh, protoplast. As shown here, much higher luminescence signal was observed when DOF 2.1 was present. This result uh, strongly suggests that DOF 2.1 can bind and activate the expression of MTL, the gene uh, responsible for several order of durian fruit. And this is the first report on identification of transcription factor controlling durian order. With that, I'd like to summarize our findings. Using transcriptome Y approach, we found 15 dots uh, expressed in durian pulp. We chose two candidates uh, for further analysis and found that cyclic DOF2 
uh, positive correlate with oxygen and ethylene biosynthesis and also starch degradation via beta amylase. And DOF2.1 can um, regulate the expression of MGL genes involved in aroma formation. And we hope that a COVID-19 situation would improve very soon and we can further perform additional experiment to deepen our finding. Um, before finishing, I'd like to emphasize again on our cultural development, uh, cultural dependent uh, cyclic DOF2 that can potentially be developed as a molecular marker uh, for selecting uh, slow ripening cultiva in the future. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much for uh, your talk uh, from Associate Professor Dr. Supaat. Uh, now it's time to open the, the question Q&A session. Are there any questions from the floor? If uh, there is no question, now let's move on to the next topic uh, presented by Associate Professor Dr. Shuli Yongpakdi. Uh, Dr. Shuli, Associate Professor Dr. Shuli will talk about the development of a yeast test essay and screening for compounds that can elevate the toxicity of human alpha cyanide cyanocline and neurodegenerative disease associated protein. Please welcome Dr. Shuli. Good afternoon, everyone. The topic of my talk today is development of a yeast-based assay and screening for compounds that can alleviate the toxicity of human alpha cyanocline a neurodegenerative disease associated protein. The world is facing the problem on the increasing number of aging population. This leads to increase in the number of patients with multiple non-communicable disease as well, including neurodegenerative disease. This disease caused by the misfall uh, of some certain protein. Uh, the protein, uh, the misfall protein got aggregate and uh, form the fiber. The accumulation of the aggregated protein cause dysfunction in, the, in some cellular compartment. Alpha cyanocrine misfolding uh, uh, will form a cytoplasmic inclusion known as Lewis body, and this will disturb uh, several cellular uh, pathway. Parkinson's disease is one of the new low uh, alpha cyanocrinopathy. Uh, the symptom is uh, lead to reduction in dopamine neurotransmitter, resulting in movement disorder in patient. Currently used drug could not effective for treatment of Parkinson, just control the symptom. So new therapeutic approach is needed. The uh, therapeutic approach targeting alpha cyanocrine have to approach. One is to inhibit the accumulation of alpha cyanocrine, or the other is to uh, enhance the degradation of alpha cyanocrine. Yeast saccharomyces cerevisiae or Baker yeast is a suitable uh, organism for uh, uh, drug screening tools. The human alpha synocrine overexpression in yeast cause cytotoxic to the cell and eventually uh, lead to cell death. This phenomenon just like uh, of that observed in mammalian cells. In yeast, the RSP5 gene encode uh, ubiquitin like gas. Uh, this RSP5 is a uh, uh, a uh, homolog of the mammalian net 4, uh, the E3 ubiquitin like gas. Previous studies show that a point mutation in the RSP5 gene 
in the in which the Arani residue at position 401 was changed to glutamate. This mutant was found to have much more sensitive to various stresses, uh, including uh, sensitive to alpha cytokine accumulation. So this study aimed to develop a novel high throughput yeast based assay system for screening compound that can alleviate alpha cytokine toxicity and some compound will be uh, screened. Uh, first, we construct the assay strain by choose, uh, we chose the strain with genes encoding ABC transporter effect pumps has been deleted. Uh, this drug sensitive yeast strain was further manipulated uh, that we introduced the RSP5 for A401E into the yeast genome in the place of the ISP5 white type. This strain, so-called TK01, uh, is show uh, highly sensitive to high temperature and also sensitive to proline analog ASAPC. When alpha semicrine overexpress in the uh, TK01 strain uh, under induction, the mutant strain show highly sensitive to alpha semicrine than the RSP5 by type. So the TK01 strain over express alpha semicrine will be used in our yeast based assay. We'll be setting up uh, the yeast based assay in high throughput format using the lisazulin as the indicator for living cells. In the living cell, lisazulin uh, blue color and slightly fluorescent uh, uh, was reduced to lisolufin, the pink color and highly fluorescent. The, uh, this fluorescent uh, will be monitored for the growth of the cells. Uh, the parameters that uh, we need to uh, optimize include the concentration of lisazulin, and we found that uh, 0.2 millimolar is optimal. Initial cell concentration was found optimal between 5 times 10 to the 4th, 2 times 10 to the 5 cells per mil, and the incubation time with lisazulin should be at least 240 minutes. Then we validate our assay system. This system are uh, based on the assumption that uh, the TK01 strain overexpressed alpha cytokine will be toxic and could not be able to grow. When uh, the test compound was added, if it can uh, elevate the toxicity of alpha cytokine inside the cells, then the, se uh, the cell could be able to grow. Two known compounds that have a positive and negative effect was chosen uh, for the study. By Kali, the alpha synuclein activation inhibitor was chosen for the positive effect. Uh, the various concentration was varied in the TK01 uh, overexpressed alpha synuclein, and the results show high fluorescent intensity, indicating that uh, this strain uh, uh, could be able to grow well uh, with the treatment of 5 micromolar microline. On the other hand, uh, the TK01 hardly only empty vector, no alpha centipin expression. There are no difference between the fluorescent intensity in cell uh, between treat and untreat. So uh, in this uh, experiment, uh, 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 point out that uh, this assay system is quite uh, sensitive uh, assay. And next, we use the uh, ampicillin, the negative effect uh, of the compound. We uh, could not detect any uh, difference of the fluorescence intensity of the treat and untreated, meaning that our system could not detect the no effect compound. It is uh, indicating that our assay system is highly specific. Next, we uh, compare 
uh, the same background stain but differ in the ISP5. One is a white type form and the other is the mutant form. And to see which one is more sensitive to alpha senic cream. Uh, again, Bikeline was used to test this and the results show that uh, the mutant strain show faster uh, metabolic rate uh, of uh, uh, lysazoline reduction than the wild, that of the white type strain. So this means that the RSP5A401 mutant strain was more sensitive than the RSP5 white type strain. Then we used uh, the develop this base assay to screen 33 compounds isolated from high medicinal plant and uh, detected uh, compared the percent reduction of alpha synchrone toxicity. Eight out of 33 compounds was picked up for the first uh, uh, assay. Then uh, we determined the minimal effective concentration and found ASCY 130 isolated from Stefania Superlosa for men show the most potent compound with the lowest minimal effective concentration. So in conclusion, we successfully established a highly sensitive and, sensi uh, and specific yeast-based assay uh, for the compound that can alleviate the toxicity of alpha cyanocrine. The candidate could be used as a compound for uh, therapeutic agent to treat uh, uh, Parkinson's disease in the future. Finally, I would like to thank Asahi Glass Foundation and the Global Collaborative Program, NALA Institute of Science and Technology for financial support. And I thank Professor Hiroshi Taraki from Japan and Professor Akisha Suksamran from Ramkhamhen University for their high collaborator. And, and I would like to thank all students involved in the, uh, this project. Finally, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much for your uh, sharing this with us today. Uh, now it's time for the question. If there are any questions, I will quickly move to the next topic, which is the, presented by Dr. Zarat Rakvipakit in the topic of non-invasive blood glucose monitoring through optical fiber technologies. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jalalami Pawaki from the International School of Engineering, Jalalangkong University. Today, I'm going to present you the non-invasive blood glucose monitoring through optical fiber technology. And this project is funded by the Asahi Glass Foundation. Talking about the uh, uh, blood glucose monitoring, we are going to think about a fingerprint test because it is the conventional glucose monitoring device. However, it is the invasive device and can be painful to the patient. Therefore, we would like to propose the technique to monitor the glucose level in the diabetic patients non-invasively. Breath analysis is considered to be used to detect the volatile organic compounds in exhaled breath and it is non-invasive. The volatile organic compounds is considered because many of them are the biomarkers for the chronic disease. For example, acetone, isopropanol, or IPA are the biomarkers for diabetes. Acetone and isoprenes are the biomarkers for the lung cancer. So in this work, we are going to focus on the isopropanol or the IPA because we would like to study the biomarkers for the diabetes. So this project would like to develop a single sign analog project on optical fiber sensor. And the optical fiber sensor has a single mode, multi mode, single mode structure. We develop this sensor to detect the volatile organic compounds or the IPA, which is the biomarker for the diabetes. With this objective, we are going to include the design of the sensor to achieve the um, maximum sensitivity as much as possible. And we are going to study the single-sign nanorod coated on the optical fiber using the hydrothermal growth. And then we will fabricate the sensor to have the single mode, multi mode, single mode structure using the splicing technique. And after that, we are going to characterize the fabricated sensor with the IPA absorption. 
So let's start with the first uh, step, which is the design of the structure. So the multi-mode fiber is in the middle. It is sandwiched by two single-mode fiber at both ends. That's why we have it as a single-mode, multi-mode, single-mode structure or SMS. This multi-mode fiber is the special fiber, which is a called silica fiber. It is considered to be the sensing region where the zinc oxide nanorods will be coated. And this zinc oxide nanorod is going to be exposed to the medium or the IPA. The IPA will be absorbed on this zinc oxide nanorods layer, and we are going to detect the output signal that is changed accordingly due to the exposure with the IPA. In order to um, obtain the sensor with the maximum sensitivity as much as possible, we need to consider the length of the multimode region, which is a region. So we need to decide what would be the optimum length. And because the collet silica fiber is still considered to be the multimode fiber, it allows several modes of the light to be guided inside the structure. With these multiple modes of the light guided inside, it's going to create the interference pattern. And with this interference phenomenon occurring in the multimode fiber region, we can calculate for the coupling efficiency. So as you can see, at the different length of the multimode fiber, we get a different coupling efficiency. At this peak, we get the highest maximum, uh, the highest coupling efficiency. So if we have the sensor to be uh, around 14.28 centimeters, we are going to get the maximum output signal and we call it as a really reaching distance. However, with the 14 centimeter, it's too long for the sensor. It's not practical. So we are going to optimize the sensor length to be around 5.4 centimeters because at this location, even though we don't get a maximum output signal, but we will get the signal to be high enough in order to detect the change when there is the absorption occurring on the surface of the sensor. After we get the optimum distance of the sensor to be around five centimeters, we are going to fabricate the sensor by cutting it and cleave it using the cleaver. And then we are going to get that fiber for the seeding of the zinc oxide by dropping the zinc acetate on the fiber. And this is going to be done on the hot plate. After that, we anneal it in the oven. After we get the seeded fibers, we are going to have the hydrothermal growth of the zinc oxide. By immersing this seeded fiber into the zinc nitrate solution and put it in the oven for three to eight hours, we can vary the time depending on how long we want the zinc oxide nanorod to be. If we want a long nanorod, we will leave the um, seeded fiber for a longer time. After we get the zinc oxide nanorod coated on the fiber, we are going to split it between two single mode fibers to make it as an SMS structure. So um, this is the SEM image showing the zinc oxide nanorod coated on the called silica fiber. If we zoom in onto the surface, we see that after we leave the um, zinc oxide, into the oven for three hours, we already have the drops occur. However, the uniformity might not be good and also the collapse can occur. This occur due to the cutting process before we put it in the SEM. If we put the um, fibers into the oven for a longer period of time, we are going to see that the length of the zinc oxide nanorod is going to be increased. But if we put it too long, but the diameter of the nanorod is going to be the same, so it starts collapsing. With the seven hours, we are not going to get the rods anymore because the length of the rod is too long for that diameter. So we say that the optimum times we put for the single side nanorod growth is about three to five hours. And this is the fabricated sensor. So we try to get the sensor length to be around 5.4 centimeters, but it is very difficult to get an exact um, dimension. So we get about 5.5 centimeters. So this is the region of the sensing area. And we also prepare the sensor without any signal side coating on the top of the surface. So to compare the, the response of these two sensors. 
and we are going to have the optical setup to characterize the sensor. The experimental setup includes the broadband light source here, connected to one end of the sensor. The other end of the sensor is connected to the spectrometer and the laptop for the signal analysis. Let's take a look um, at the sensor. So the sensor will be tested in the chamber. And inside the chamber, we have the IPA reservoir. So we drop the IPA solution in it and we leave it for some period of time. IPA is a volatile compound, so it is easily evaporated. After we leave it for some time, the IPA vapor will fill out the chamber and it's going to be absorbed by the single oxide nanorod layer on the sensor. So if we take a look on the results, we are using the intensity modulation in order to investigate the response of the sensor. So the single side nanorod are uh, coated on the sensor that we prepare. We have like a several links because we would like to study the effect of the link on the fiber as well. We can see that but for the sensor without any single side coating, we can see some change but the dynamic change is very small. Therefore, the sensitivity of the non-coated sensor is not going to be high. If we call the single side nanorod on the sensor, we can clearly see the intensity drop due to the absorption of the IPA vapor on the single side nanorod. And the dynamic change is larger compared to the non-coated sensor. This shows us that the sensitivity of the single side coated sensor will be better than the non-coated sensor. And also the length of the sensor will also affect the uh, response. This one is also depending on the coupling efficiency. So we need to go to, to look at the coupling efficiency graph and see what will be the location of the sensor that we have replicated. So in the summary, I would say that we successfully fabricated and developed the single sign nanorod coded optical fiber bed sensor to detect the IPA, which is uh, one of the biomarkers for diabetes. Even though the numerical monitoring suggests us to have the 14 centimeter long of the fiber of the sensor, but uh, it's not practical. So we optimize it to be about five centimeters and we use three hour hydrothermal growth of the single sign nanorod on the sensor. And the result shows that the um, single oxide nanorods are able to absorb the IPA inside their matrix and give a better dynamic change compared to the non-coded sensor. So with the single oxide nanorod coded sensor, it improved the sensitivity of the sensor. However, there are a lot of rooms left to uh, investigate further and improve this project. For example, by studying the growth time and sensing length, we can improve the sensitivity, sensitivity of the sensor. And also we can investigate more onto the other volatile compounds. So we can get the uh, accurate sensor to detect for the glucose level, which is going to be the non-invasive device in the future. So I would like to thank you, the Asahi Glass Foundation, and other organizations for supporting this project. Thank you so much for Dr. Sarat uh, talk. Now it's time. I, I, I think it is uh, almost four o'clock, so I will skip the Q&A session. So we will move to the final topic, which is presented by Dr. Sutke Chayo. Uh, Dr. Sutket will going to present in the topic of non-enzymatic electrochemical chemical detection of cholesterol using beta glycodextrin immobilized on 3D paper-based device. Please welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sutket Sayo. Today, I would like to present my work in the topic of non-enzymatic cholesterol detection based on beta glycodextrin modified 3D paper-based sensor. The cholesterol bus level should be contained in the variety of disease such as coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. 
uh, for the high concentration of cholesterol more than 240 milligram per deciliter indicate that uh, the list of disease. So analytic how may start for detect cholesterol level in the high sensitivity and selectivity is required. This slide shows the conventional method for determination of cholesterol, such as chromatography with different type of detectors, such as HPLC and GC. The all methods show the high sensitivity and selectivity, but this method still have the high cost and cannot on the field detection. So electrochemical detection is the popular technique that have been applied to cholesterol point of care testing. Recently, the electrochemical cholesterol detection can be category of enzyme based detection and non enzyme detection. For the, uh, for the enzymatic detection, the cholesterol oxidase enzyme is actually immobilized on the electrode surface. Inside base sensor have been reported as ampere biosensor. Nowadays, most of commercial cholesterol sensor based on the uh, inside system due to the high sensitivity and excellent selectivity. However, uh, this method still have the drawbacks such as uh, degradation of enzymatic activity and low spatiality of uh, sensor. To prove the drawback, many have uh, many publications have been reported to the detect non enzymatic cholesterol. Beta psychotic is one of the material used to the cholesterol without the enzyme due to this uh, ability to encapsulate hydrophobic compound this internal community of beta cyclodectin or low hydrophobic cholesterol molecule to be suitable in the aqueous solution. This slide showed for example the use of the basicodectin to detect cholesterol. However, uh, the provide method used the uh, non-enzymatic for determination cholesterol uh, still have the disadvantage such as many steps, last volume sample, uh, non-possible and still have the high, high cost. So for the objective in this work, we introduce for the first time of the 3D electrochemical paper-based analytical device for the non enzymatic detection for cholesterol by modifying uh, with beta cyclodectin. The my DUI uh, consists of two parts. The first part, origami, uh, pass order or pass. And the second part, uh, insert pass. Uh, or the iPad. For the OPAS, the, uh, the OPAS, uh, but, uh, beta sequencing was immobilized on the cellulose paper. First of all, we would like to change the functional group of beta sequencing by reacting with uh, chloro acetic acid. And then we got the carboxylic uh, methyl beta cyclodectin for the immobilize on the cellulose paper. After that, we activate uh, carboxylic, uh, carboxylic methyl beta cyclodectin by uh, carbodiamine first for the one hour, you can see. And then we drop this solution onto the uh, OPAD uh, for the immobilized beta cyclodectin on the paper in the hour, in the one hour. After one hour, we get the paper bed uh, immobilized the beta cyclodectin. Um, the binding carboxylic beta cyclodectin on the paper was confirmed by FT. 
I am spectroscopy. The left one shows the spectrum of the bare paper, and the blue one shows the spectrum of the beta cyclotectin on paper. You can see that the spectrum of the carboxylic methyl beta cyclotectin shows the signature peak as uh, here and here, here and here. Uh, so we have the success the modify uh, the beta cyclotectin on the cellulose on paper. The uh, and the second part, uh, the insert pad or the iPad, uh, consists of the sampling zone, washing zone, analytical zone. The analytical zone uh, include the working electrode, reference electrode, and counter electrode. Uh, for the fabrication of 3D iPad, we cut here, you can see here, and then we file down this layer and we file up on this layer and for the ipad we file we, we fold up on the ipad like here like here and we insert the ipad in the old pad like here and finally we fold up to, up the sample layer on the insert pad for the uh, for the operation of gd e pad the layer of the gd e pad consists of the top layer top insert layer beta cyclotectin paper layer uh, below insert layer and wash wash uh, waste layer for the first, uh, we apply the, the sample on the top layer. This section show incubation of cholesterol in the, in the, in the sample. Uh, you can see the, the, the blue one uh, is called for the incubation cholesterol and beta cyclodectin. And then, We uh after thirty minutes we slide here for the watching step. This step show the moving out of the various metric in the little sample, and then you can see uh the blue one is the open for the watching everything go to the west layer, and then for the uh, analytical sample uh, we slide here for the cross cross system for the stop stop solution for the analytical performance uh, and finally we apply the potential for the detecting the uh, electro transfer uh, signal of the first signal This slide shows the video of operation of 3D EPAD. First, we drop sample uh, for incubation for the uh, interact between uh, cholesterol and beta cyclodectin. And then we slide and we drop, we drop uh, buffer solution. Uh, to the watching sample, uh, to the watching the other metric in the real sample, go to the wet water for the five minutes. And then we slide and we apply potential for detecting the electron transfer signal of the furry CNA for the gas, the, uh, the current. Uh, for the result, first we characterization this sensor by psychic photometry and electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Uh, you can see that the back line show the bare 
paper, you can see the small peak. And then we uh, use the paper, securitizing, uh, better paper have the better securitizing on the surface. You can see the peak length is higher. Uh, beta circulating have uh, cholesterol 0 0.1 millimolar. You can see the peak length is decreased. In the high concentration cholesterol, you can see the peak length is decreased. The result indicate that uh, the successfully for the fabrication of the cholesterol sensor uh, using beta circulating for detection of cholesterol. For the differential power voltammetry or the DPV result, you can see that when increase the concentration of cholesterol, the signal of ferrous decrease because uh, of, because of the binding of between cholesterol and beta beta-secreting or the paper uh, effect to the difficult electron transfer of ferrous on the electrode. Uh, this slide show the optimization. And then uh, uh, under optimization, we study the performance, analytical performance, uh, such as linearity, LD, and LQ. The sensor provides the linearity for the cholesterol detection between 0 0.1 to 1000 uh, micromolar. And LD is the 30 nanomolar and LOD is 0 0.1 micromolar. Uh, this slide shows the selectivity of the cholesterol sensor. The, this sensor was evaluated by using commonly in the following compound in the bus sample, including BSA, glucose, casein, uric acid. Uh, ascorbic acid, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, maximum chloride, and carbohydrate. So the result indicates that the sensor was highly uh, selective to the detect of only cholesterol. And finally, we apply this sensor for detection of cholesterol in the blood sample compared with the uh, Commercial detector, you can see that the result of uh, both method was not uh, significant different and uh, percent recovery and percent re uh, SD are acceptable. And finally, in question, conclusion, we successfully for development of Novel platform 3D e pad sensor for detonation of cholesterol using beta secretin modified on the cellulose filter paper. And then this sensor offers the advantage of low sample volume, low cost, portable, and short analysis, analysis time. And finally, this sensor. Uh, provide uh, successfully to apply for definition of cholesterol in the bus sample. And finally, I would like to thank uh, the Asahi Glass Foundation and Sulalongkar University. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sutket, for your talk. As Dr. Sutket has to leave the seminar, uh, for the next interview. So if you have some question, you can post it on the chat box in your, con uh, in your Zoom control below. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, as this is the last topic, it's been an honor to be among such an accomplished individual for me. I hope you enjoy the program and uh, thank you very much for your attention and participation. Uh, now it's time to end the session. Have a nice day. Bye.